Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. about the wrapping paper project and all that we've been talking about because it is the holidays and our job is to reach out to our past clients, centers of influence, and anybody else who you can uh, rain your happiness upon with your wrapping paper. And so it's funny on our, our private Facebook page for all of our premier coaching members, they're all joking about how the dollar store people are making fun of them because they're buying like, uh, you can buy a crate of wrapping paper. They're a dollar a piece, but you can buy them in crates of like 48 so these agents are just like raiding the Dollar Tree store. Well, it's so a big tube of yeah. uh, wrapping paper is a dollar. A dollar. At the Dollar Tree. At the Dollar Tree. So those of you who are, you know, doing crazy things like buying leads and spending thousands of dollars and, and then wondering why your past clients aren't calling you, do something more proactive that's way less expensive and way more fun. So, yes, I wanted to recognize uh, Elizabeth Blevins and Missy Perry and Molly Krause and Greg Hawkins and Beth Zulu. Zulo and of course Coach Rochelle, who was the impetus of all of this, because she always loves to do stuff like this. You know, it's kind of funny yeah. too. If you think about it, there's no way it costs only a dollar to make a big roll of no. wrapping paper. I know. So What's the markup is, in that, right? This, well, this <laughs> so this is probably um, wrapping paper that's been in uh, storage that comes out every year. Oh, for sure. Right. I mean, since like 1972. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, it didn't sell it this year. Let's see what no. we do next. Year. I know. It'll be funny if we we hear uh, reports that Dollar Tree is being raided. And all of a sudden, there's a run on wrapping paper. Maybe it'll be like the toilet paper run of 2020. <laughs> That's funny. But here, uh, keeping this in mind, though, if for those of you who get stuck maybe on the uh, fact that Christmas is prominently, obviously, a Christian holiday, uh, all religions give gifts this time of year. Um, well, yeah, and you can buy wrapping paper that's snowmen a, or snowflakes right, exactly. or gold or whatever, you know. So that's fine. Don't, don't you know, give yourself objections and excuses not to do it. Yeah, it's a great idea. Even if you're the most, you know, dug-in driver, this is still a fantastic way for you to, A, keep yourself busy, B, and put yourself in front of a lot of people that your centers of influence and past clients. And it's a hell of a lot of fun, too. I mean, yeah, honestly. absolutely. And there's lots of versions of the tag uh, that goes on there. Of course, you're going to use a hole punch and, and put your business card on there. But with a nice little holiday saying, they're kind of dressing it up with, um, you know, just uh, plaid or whatever you want to do to make it look kind of fancy. And you can say, friends don't let friends get wrapped up with the wrong realtor. Uh, one of them posted, uh, don't get wrapped up with all of the stress. Call me for your real estate success. That's awesome. So I thought that was pretty cool, too. And they're all sharing that on the Facebook page. So well, kudos so to them. Just to drill it down to help people yeah. take this idea into the end zone. You're obviously the tube of wrapping paper, yep. and then there's some sort of handwritten card. Why not? Mm -hmm. Obviously, they could use the sure. back of their business card. Yes, that would be a sure. no-brainer move. Mm -hmm. And then hole hole punching the uh, the business card and then yep. tying it on. Tying it with piece. ribbon, and some people are adding candy canes or something fun like that. Yeah, um, curling ribbon. You know, once you get going on this, you can be really creative, and you know, the point is to make people smile. Right. That's it. Simple enough. I love Simple that enough. story. Yeah. yeah. Well, these are the types of things. Oh, they're we... just getting started. You just wait. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> the, because people will start uh, competing. For they are ideas. Uh, totally. They're all posting different cards and you know versions of that, and them sitting in their living rooms putting it together, and and uh, what the cart looks like at checkout with people uh, giving them a hard time. One of them, the checkout lady, uh, insisted on counting the rolls three times. So you know, off to the races. It is kind of funny though if you think about this compared to uh, giving out pumpkin pies. Yeah. You know, it, we have to remind ourselves that we pick up new listeners to this podcast every day. So, and some of you guys They've won't know what we're talking this. about, but I, yeah, you, you're going like, what the hell is real estate coaching radio? These people are crazy. Yeah. Well, yes, we are partially crazy. That's true. We've been coaching agents Obviously. for two decades. That'll happen. <laughs> but one of the, we, no, we are not advocates of this. We get the idea of it. We appreciate the concept of it, but this is kind of something funny that's been, I don't know, almost institutionalized amongst a lot of agents. And again, I'm just telling this for the sake of those of you who don't know or haven't heard of this. So there's some agents that will go to Costco and they do this every year. And con again, conceptually, it's a great idea if you do it right. I'll give you Lance and Karen. Lance and Karen sure. can more do it right. They've got a great office. It's right in Kennewick, Washington. Julie and I were there with Zoe in August and it was just Beautiful really impressive. Office. And so what they do is they go to Costco and they buy pallets. Of pumpkin. Yeah, but they cut a deal. I think they get them for like five bucks. So they buy pallets of pumpkin pies and then they have the pumpkin pies sitting at their office and then they let all their centers of influence mm -hmm. and past clients know 
to stop by and pick up their uh, their pumpkin pies. And, and they made it an event. Yeah, and that's true. They'll do it over an event, and they'll yeah. just make it so it's special. Exactly. Didn't they also say that some years they have, like, Santa that's there? Yeah, they've done the different kids. things. They have, like, apple cider sitting out. And, yeah. you know, I, I like that because – it's a lot of bang for the buck. You know, they're not spending that much money on it. And they are having their past clients and center of influence come to them. So they're not having to drive all over the place. Now, so here's the ro- nice. But here's, again, we're we're giving you guys an option. Obviously, this is expensive. It takes time. Pumpkin pie thing. You're going to have to, I mean, God forbid you have all these things left over. What are you going to do with them? <laughs> you right. know, but the, the uh, wrapping paper idea is a great idea. But here's the funny part of the uh, pumpkin pie thing. And Julie, can you tell them about how there's been... A, <laughs> yeah, here's the thing. Well, two here's examples. The wrong, yeah. Here's the wrong way to do it. <laughs> here's the wrong way to do it. Okay, so it's called the drop and run, right? So some of you guys do that because you're avoiding contact. Others of you do it because nobody was home to actually open the door for you. But you leave the pumpkin pie on the front porch. Well, several instances have occurred where we get reports back as coaches where you'll say, you're not going to believe what happened. I'm never going to do this again. And we'll say, oh, why is that? Because so-and-so, my past client that I sold two houses for, called me and they said that raccoons just raided the whole thing. They took the packaging off. They smeared the pumpkin pile over the front porch. What in the world were you thinking doing that? So it can backfire if you do it wrong. I also had uh, one of our coaching clients, one of our newer clients, that hadn't quite gotten with the program yet. Uh, she's She said, well, I'm just driving by and throwing the wrapping paper on the porch. I'm like, you know what? Here's the thing. You're missing the You're damn missing point. the point. You have to you're make the, contact. You're at the paper boy. I don't mean like physically winging at them contact. Yeah, You've the, got to make a conversation, people. The point is the contact, not just, <laughs> yeah. But so, Julie, uh, yeah. one more story, and let's get finished up our mm-hmm. points on Centers mm-hmm. of Influence and Past Clients. Sure. So you, when we sold real estate, mm-hmm. were, were showing a house once. Mm-hmm. And the house you are showing had a sign, please do not let the cats out. Oh, my gosh. This is a hilarious Julie so Harris funny. story. So, Julie, tell us. Well, story. so let's do a little <laughs> prequel to that. Time and time again, you and I would advise our listing clients, look, if you have, you know, indoor, outdoor cats, if you have animals that don't go outside, put a sticky note on the door so that we don't lose one of your pets inadvertently through showings, right? So this is part of our thing that we always would say. So I always have this on my mind. I'm out there showing. I, I can tell you where the house was. It was on West North Broadway in Clintonville. Okay, and it was a cute two-story house, first-time buyers, and this this lady had a sticky note. It wasn't our listing we were showing, and she had a sticky note on the door to the screened-in porch and then from the screened-in porch to the steps going to the backyard. Don't let the cats out. I'm like, okay, gosh, you know, and, and so I see a couple of cats in the backyard. I gather them up. I put them on the screened-in porch. There's already another cat out there. I'm like, she cares about her cats, right? She, she thought somebody, Julie had thought somebody had been there before, let the cats out, and then, you know, Julie was trying to be, do a, a good deed. The, she yeah. didn't let the cats out. She wasn't no. thinking she let the cats out. She was thinking the showing prior let the cats That's out. That's right. I so, better go get them. So Julie's doing her, her good deed for the day and then so puts, these, <laughs> puts these cats into the screened-in porch. Yes. Well, a uh, couple hours later, I get a call from the actual listing agent saying, what were you thinking? My seller called me. They said, why did you put a couple of stray cats on my porch? They kicked the crap out of my cat. What are you doing? <laughs> And I'm like, you know what? Honest to God, I was trying to do the right thing. So that that actually is in my collection of stories for our uh, eventual book. Remember, I won't do it on this podcast, but remember Blue Shoes and oh yeah, we had, some so the, many, all of you will have if, if you know once you've been in this business for a long in. time, you will have your own collection of stories that are almost too strange to. Um, I'm just thinking I have a, having more rush <laughs> to my know, head as I was talking. But it's almost too strange to imagine the things you'll experience when you're dealing with masses of humanity. Indeed. You know, we used to sell between 100 and 200 houses per year, mostly listings. And, yeah, man, you run across mostly really good people. And really then nice. you run across a few jackholes. And then you run across a lot of people yeah. that are someplace on the spectrum of... About every 50th deal, I think it feels yeah. like. They, they, something is just not right, either with the house or the people. All right, so I want to tell you guys oh, one no. more story since we're on stories. It's Stories Friday. And again, we are going to finish up mm-hmm. our points about centers of influence and past clients. So we would sell a lot of real estate in this area called Clintonville, uh, Worthington. This is where we got our... This is where Julie and I met, actually, when we were in high school. And so this is where we started selling real estate. So it turns out... In our, we, when we'd sell a house, we would sell, send out just sold cards because just sold cards, this was, a lot of this was pre-internet. <laughs> I know. I know. Which is they can't imagine, say. right? Yeah. And so direct mail actually was very effective pre-internet. You yes. Know, hopefully you're understanding what I'm saying. In some markets, if the uh, 
demographic as mostly older people, uh, direct mail will still be highly effective. But for the most part, direct mail has gone the way of, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the, the, uh, the book. MLS book. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. All right. So in our, our geographic area that we would, again, we sold a listing, we do just sold cards, just sold cards, by the way, got calls, just listed cards. I mean, just sold cards, we get calls from potential sellers, just listed cards would get you nothing. So just there FYI for those of you who are doing direct mail. Well, in our market, there was a very famous, what's the way to say it? Psychi psychiatric hospital oh, yes. card called Harding Hospital. It, it is quite famous, actually. It, yeah. is, it is very famous. I didn't famous. realize that living there, but yeah. Right. And we grew up around it. And we didn't really think anything of it. But it's just basically this big, it's not even like, I don't even know what it is. It's a compound and a state. Yeah. It's internationally known. It had, um, you know, if you guys watched that series that was on Netflix uh, recently about the guy that had one of the first multiple personality types. And he, I don't remember his name. But that took place in yeah. effect, the Harding Hospital where he was staying was right in Julie and I's geographic uh, area where we sold, again, where we got started selling real estate. Well, it turns out that the, the each of the home, like when you are, I don't know, it's not inmate. I don't know what it would be. <laughs> it's, it's sort of an inmate patient type deal. A guest, we'll say. A guest, right. Well, let's just, let's just say a patient. A patient. But yes. most of them, you know, you're behind lock and key. But each of the patient's rooms or how we never went there or went on the property so we wouldn't really know so we're only speculating at this point but on in, within harding hospital there were a ton of individual addresses and i'm guessing at least probably 50 yeah i'm guessing mm -hmm. and so when every time we do a direct mail piece that would make its way to harding hospital yeah for the just for the just sold cards we would you know sure enough we'd start getting all of these really interesting phone calls and it would happen <laughs> It, it, we didn't know why. Like we didn't, we hadn't, we yeah. didn't figure it out because these were. We would mail these uh, postal carrier routes sorted, which means the mailman, which means there was no address on them. The uh, address on the card said uh, to postal customer, right? Yeah. And then the address. So we didn't know. We only knew that, say, 500 cards were going out to this geographic area. Yeah, we didn't have all the fancy stuff where you could sift and sort like you guys now. Well, you did now. We Not did, as much. but we are doing you know. it super cheap. The yeah. least expensive stamp that you can send something by if you're going to do a po is called Postal Carrier reach, Route Sorted, which means the mailman just delivers it and the, uh, the address says, you guys you look in your mailbox, you get this stuff too. You know, postal customer or, or resident whatever. Or resident, whatever. neighbor yeah. at, whatever mm -hmm. it says, and then the address. That's all, you know, something that's, you, that's it. You just drop the cards off the post office and they take it from there. Well, so that's what we were doing. And we would get all of these really amazingly weird uh, theatrical calls from what we later, year, and by later, I mean years later, learned. <laughs> we finally figured it out. I don't even remember how we figured it out. Yeah. But know. we are getting calls from people that were institutionalized. Yes. And heavily sedated or should we, have been, We frankly. were inadvertently prospecting the Looney Tunes. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's being very disrespectful, Julie. Of well, the, of the I took some of those calls. Of the psychiatric impaired. <laughs> I'm saying. <laughs> so, know, yeah, but, moral of the story is maybe you should be more careful. We had, had so, so Julie and I, for a while, we had an office at the actual uh, Remax office we were with. And there was, um, we different have different staff members that would come and go, and they were all, you know, we all partake, uh, participated in pre-screening and pre-qualifying. And on everyone's desk, there was two stacks of, uh, we this is, you know, we used paper, right? So there's a red paper that was for seller pre-qual, blue, you know, blue stack of buyer pre-qual. And it was our scripts that were written out with that the person pre-qualifying the person was then supposed to essentially read along and fill in the Ask blanks. Ask all the questions. And, and fill in the, the blanks. As they, exactly. And then that would be that would then be rooted to whoever was responsible uh, for that particular you know lead, that type of lead. Buyer, mm -hmm. Be it a buyer lead, would go to the buyer's agents, and be it a seller lead, would go, obviously go to our – it was you know Julie and I and Lisa, a gal that would go on listing appointments for us. So uh, the when we would be in the office and when these cards would go to the people that were in Harding Hospital – and we would hear these agents that work for us pre-qualifying those experiences, just standing back and listening to them, trying to ask the questions and then writing down their answers. I'm telling you, that would be that could be a uh, a multi-year Netflix special. Just that. Seriously, I mean, I do remember. I don't know if this was because of those cards, but I remember one of them was doing a pre-qual script, and they asked occupation. You know, it's kind of like a light pre-qual, making sure yeah, somebody yeah. has a job. You know, and the answer was clown. Yeah, I kid you not. Like, and she's like. Clown, that's interesting. Is that what you put on your tax return? <laughs> like, where do you go from there, you know? Uh, so That's yes. the world. We digress. That's what we have, but still it's Friday. They I appreciate know. it. Yeah. I mean, they've all had They've long, all been there and done that. <laughs> well, most of them. Or people who just I mean, got their life. I mean, you are making me remember stories of 
I, I mean, I remember going on one that was I, the mom of one of our, of one of uh, somebody from my center of influence for music. And she was, you know, I think everybody's been in like the kind of creepy old lady house that has too much stuff in it type of listing, you know. That's and she pretty, was nice. You, you pretty much described all your family, basically. Uh, hilarious. That's, yeah, that's what it feels like going back to Ohio. Who's living with us. But uh, so I'm, d- I'm doing this one on my own, you know, because this is my center of influence. It should be easy peasy. And she's everything in the upstairs was fine. Then she takes me downstairs and she had all these rooms, like finished lower level kind of thing individual rooms and they all had were under lock and key and i'm like what's the deal with this well she's been renting these rooms out what yeah I oh you i do remember that yeah and so i'm thinking like that was in worthington wasn't yeah it? it was i mean it's a nice street too and I'm, I'm starting to get more and more creeped out and then she shows me into one of these rooms and you know those little uh like basement windows that are kind of small yeah she had poured cement on the outside to close that in, which not only is massively against code, right, but also is like, why would somebody do that? Because you're trying to keep your people in the room. And so at that point, I kid you not, I excused myself. I'm like, let's go and talk upstairs or maybe on the back porch because I just, you know how sometimes like the hair on the back of your neck stands up? So this was a friend of yours. A I'll, friend I'll of tell yours you mom. who it was later. It was actually, you know, uh, I think if I remember correctly, it was somebody for you from your center of influence too. Oh, then most certainly it was for sure. Somebody, creepy. but you, it gave what you the, the, gave you the creeps. What was the first name? Brian, I think. <laughs> oh, I know you know talking. who I'm talking yeah, about. I do now. I remember. Completely. See, all these stories bring it all back. But you know, uh, there aren't that many times where I was really creeped out. I don't know freak our listeners out but that was one the other one was showing a house in new albany where the lady got out and Dude, had like you don't remember the stuff. house we went to in muirfield when we, our first oh, year in, yeah. first year in the, bu- <laughs> first year in the business we went out to a listing that's where you learn what scripts not to use right it was expired it was an expired listing yeah and you're like why why this one expire you know and you walk in and it's like well, okay i can see it needs some improvements and whatnot but then we went again by the way if you guys don't live in a part of the country that has basements count yourself lucky seriously because the shit that goes on in basements probably in most cases is just stuff that frankly people don't want the light of day seeing thus no. the concrete filled window cell or uh, window uh, seriously yeah right? well so watch we, ghost adventures we go down sure. we go down the basement and then and this basement is like you know 1970s ugly like jimmy carter administration just all kinds of nastiness Shag carpet yeah and then the person uh this was the seller yeah showed us behind this wall a hidden room and this in this hidden room, it, you guys are thinking we're making this up or not. <laughs> it's this awful. hidden room, we, they opened up the door. You didn't even know there was a thing, and it opens up. And you're thinking, well, Tim, what the hell are you talking about? It's a safe room. No, it nope. wasn't. We still don't know what to use that room for. But everything inside the room was covered with the thickest, ugliest red shag carpet you've ever yep. seen. I'm talking floors, walls. I think I remember a mirror. Wasn't there a mirror? Yeah, and I think there was some red velvet, too. Yeah. It was, and the lights were red. Yeah. It was the creep, one of the creepiest things I've seen. It's so funny that you mentioned that story because I had the the uh, murder in the um, master bedroom story in the back of my head. That's the one, the are one you I talking thought about. You're, we're, okay, well, the blood that's, stains. Where, that's where our damn stories. Let's keep it going. Just let the, yeah, the cat out of the bag on this show, people. Th- this was a New Albany Country Club. This was a really nice house, and again, another expired. You guys can see a recurring theme here. Julie and I were. And very, by the way, we sold all of these. We did. We sold all of them. <laughs> you know Every what? one of them we've mentioned, we sold. <laughs> but the uh, the red room house or the the red car, the one we just talked yeah, about, Muirfield. we didn't have them change anything because we're no. like, dude, there's no place to start. In I, I like, I don't have a script for that. Yeah, I think the description <laughs> was total dumpster fire. Don't believe us? Go look yourself. <laughs> right. <laughs> Accepting all. But the offers. price is good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the price. Is good. Well, so we're walking through. <laughs> Do you remember? Okay, I don't want to get. Well, who is a doctor? I don't know if you remember that. Yeah. So this was a New Albany Country Club, and we're walking through this house. And we had heard prior to going on this listing, it was an expired listing, that they had just gone through a divorce and the whole thing. You know, you just New Albany Country Club at the time was a relatively small community, so pretty much everybody knew everyone. Yeah, business. the intel. Right. So we walked in this house, and the, the seller was super nice, super gracious. And by the way, later on, he did numerous transactions with us, and we actually became friends with him. But this is when we first met him. Um, he was an ER doc, and he was – There's, I don't know if you guys know anything about ER docs, but for the most part, that is not a long-lived career because it's so massively it's stressful. really stressful. And that's what, he, that's what his main thing was. He ran a ER – I think it was at a major hospital. He was an actual practicing ER doc. He ran mostly uh, night shifts. 
And so, you know, he was- You can only imagine what he saw. And what he sees every day. So he, you know, again, he was a bit of a character. So we're walking through this house. There's no furniture. It's relatively clean and obviously needed some, you know, normal stuff because they just moved the stuff out. And then we go upstairs in this bedroom and I don't, it wasn't, a, it wasn't the master bedroom. I no, it was the master it was the bedroom. Master. And it was tan carpet, you know, and on the carpet was this massive blood stain. Now, blood stains, and I only found out this later, not from experience, <laughs> when they get old, they turn almost like really, really super dark. Really um, gross. Almost black. So we walk in. And I jokingly said, what's this, a blood stain? And he just looked at me and Julie, because we were together on this one. And he goes, yes. And that's all he said. <laughs> when you and I looked at each other, like, like, OMG, you've got to be kidding me. And of course, we still, well, that one, we did make him change the carpet. Yeah, and I do you remember when we went to look at the master bath? And we did sell it. We did sell it. There were like uh, claw marks in the woodwork like fingernails or something like that yeah and that's you know that's i think that was the listing where we learned uh you know don't ask too much you know because you may have some weird disclosures and it just was so creepy but i don't you know we share these stories to entertain you guys and to show you that you know even let's say challenged houses do sell Right, it gets down to staging it right, describing well, it's price, it right. It's, it's, price, it's condi- price at the end of the day. It's price, condition, and location, right? At the, and at skill, the, being able to have the conversations to get sellers to do what they need to do to actually sell it. And that's, by the way, one of the best reasons to go after expired listings, especially this time of year. If you have a, a listing that's expiring this time of year, it's a fresh expired. I promise you, that seller is ready to listen about condition or price. And the script yeah. goes. I mean, this is the logic behind. But, you know, it's so funny when I say this. You and I just say this stuff almost flippantly because we assume everyone understands. Right. Guys, listen, and I know some of you will be offended, but that's okay. Marketing does not sell real estate. Now, maybe on the very, very upper ends, that's going to be an exception. Mm -hmm. But for the normal, you know, say, I would even say for most most of the country, maybe a million and less at this point. Yeah. Marketing does not sell houses. That's stuff you do to placate the seller. That's right. stuff to make the seller feel like they're getting more value for what they're paying you. The thing that sells real estate is price. At the end of the day, price overcomes everything. There's a script. It's been. It's as old as the you know, it's, it's some of our stories, frankly. <laughs> but it goes something like this, Mister Seller. Uh, when you're selling a home, I'm not going to get this right. So those of you who are script perfectionists, just bear with me here because I haven't said this in a thousand years. Well, you know, probably <laughs> pulling it out of the caverns. Yeah, of the I'm pulling it out of the cap. My own basement with no windows. <laughs> yeah. So, Mr. Seller, the, when it comes to selling real estate, it comes down to three things: price, condition, and location. So, I have three questions for mm-hmm. you. I'm good so far. I'm you impressing are, myself. Coming. Right? So, Mr. Seller, as far as the location goes, the location is what the location is. It's not like we can pick the house up and move it to across the street or closer to the, you know, this amenity in the neighborhood or further away from the power line or the busy road, right? So we the, the location the location is what the location is. And the seller will say, well, of course. Well, then the next question, Mr. Seller, with about the, the condition, is there anything that you're planning on doing to the condition of the property? And I mean in a significant way. Like, are you going to remodel the kitchen, remodel the bathroom? Are you going to add, are you, gonna add a, you know, a extra square footage? Are you going to be doing anything that's going to significantly impact the overall condition of the property and they're going to say no and then well mr seller that only leaves price so that if at the end of the day we can't do anything about the location and we can't do anything really about the condition other than obviously making it cleaner and presentable the only other thing that we can have a positive influence on is the price and mr seller this is the reason and this is the important part of the script guys we need to reposition the house on the market so that we correctly reflect the market's expectation. Now you can exchange the word market with the buyer's expectation. We need to reposition the house on the market so that we correctly reflect the buyer's expectation. That is a very nice, um, non-abrasive uh, way of telling them to lower their price. That was excellent, by the way. Thank you. Nice so job. when So when you combine those two scripts together, you're gonna have even the most dug in, like egotistical, Mm -hmm. I'm always right type seller. My price. My price, right? So you've walked around their ego and you're dealing directly with, well, it's not me, Mr. Seller, that you're that you're gonna blame me as the listing agent. It's that stinking old market, right? Right. It's not even your house. Right. You know, there's so many things that sellers take as an affront. You know, our, they say all the time it, who wins listing appointments. It was the one that had the most enthusiasm about the house, totally. right? So they can take it personally that it's against them if you get into conflict and use dumb words like price drop slash cut, all of those it's things. Amateur, it's amateur. It's, it's, it's yeah. it, it, people that talk, pe- agents at the end of the day 
who know how to say things and deliver sometimes bad news are the ones that will win consistently over a long period of time. Absolutely. And when you when you see agents talk about, well, it, Julie, we're a whole generation of agents. Mm -hmm. Most of the you know tens of thousands of people that listen to this show today, yeah, they have never had to develop skills on how to get listings priced mm -hmm. ever. They've been they lucky. Could, they could put, you know, the worst case scenario house <laughs> in the market and it's still going to sell with competing offers. If it's the its main thing is that it's available. Right. That's basically, basically it. And guess what, guys? Next year is going to be just like that, too. Mm -hmm. For sure. I, I, you know, we're writing our predictions post for 2020 yeah. or doing our show for, you know, next year. We're going to hopefully be presenting that to you guys next week. I know we've been threatening to do that. But frankly, <laughs> every time we come up with our predictions, we say, well, we need to do this better. We need to give you guys state of the art predictions. Yeah. And we're also seeing what other people are predicting, which is stuff we've already talked about on this podcast, inflation and interest rates and all the rest of it. But overall, we are going to see in some markets listings taking longer to sell. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not going to stay in a hot seller's market. It means that it's going to take more skill to get the listing in the first place mm -hmm. because there's going to be a omnipresent sense of um, the sellers in the hot seller's market are less selective on who they're going to hire to sell their house because they know the house will sell itself. That's true. Okay. When the market starts to adjust or there's fear of a market adjusting, sellers get a hell of a lot more particular. They're way more selective. They're way more, you know, mm -hmm. everything. And that's the reason you have to have skills. So if you've been successful listing a house here and there, and if you're honest with yourself, most of those have come from your centers of influence and past clients, or maybe a buyer you're Repeat working with. Repeat and referral, with. mostly. Yeah, that kind of thing. What's going to happen is even those layup listings are going to be things you have to compete for because those sellers are going to be fearful that the house will be able to sell. If not fearful if the house will sell, but fearful the house will sell for the most amount of money. That's the type mm -hmm. of thing that this, uh, you know, we're going to have waves of inflation. As Julie and I have been predicting for mm -hmm. over two years, and we've been telling you guys about this. Go listen to one of our thousands of past podcasts. We've talked about inflation. That's going to hit in earnest this year and next year. There's no doubt. And then probably not taper until 23 or 24, as in 2023 or 2024. Right. You're going to see the Fed making threats to basically raise interest rates, but they're not going to be able to. There's going to be all these types of things. People are fearing stagnation. Go back in, or uh, stagflation. Go back and listen to the interview we did with Peter Schiff uh, two weeks ago. It's already had over, did I tell you, 40,000 wow. views on YouTube. That's amazing. And I think it's probably going to have over 50 or 60,000 mm. downloads as far yeah. as our podcast goes. Well, sometimes that fear and that uncertainty because of waves of inflation and things like that, sometimes that can cool a market a little bit and make sure. people a bit more particular. And I would also add that your most motivated sellers, the ones who actually have to sell, can be the most particular because it matters more to them, right? And so the, the other thing, as I was, we were working on these um, predictions, I always have to remind myself, look, we have this whole generation of agents, more than 10 years, like a decade and a half, right? Where it's been a hot seller's market for well, the most part. It's been 14 or 15 years since the since crash. Since the crash. So and a the decade and a half. And the market started, well, let's give them, let's give yeah. them some time frames, right? Yeah. And the market really did start to rebound in uh, 2009, 2010. Yes. There was little bubble ups here and there. And then all of a sudden, basically around 2011, basically. Then off we to were, the races. Off to the races. If you've not been in the business, uh, certainly 14 or 15 years or longer, then you never experienced what we're talking about. And we're not expecting some sort of market slowdown or crash. Yeah. We're talking about a expectation shift that's going to happen amongst sellers primarily. Yes. I mean, the theme is going to be slight cooling, which is very different than a crash. But, you know, the it's thing- It's going to be fear. It's going to be fear. And here's the thing, that the bar it has been such that this generation of agents, it's different than, than before, right? Before, long days on the market was like 90 or more. Now, it's like, if it doesn't sell in the first weekend or two, oh my God, what's happening? Not just from, you know, smart agents- Hopefully they're listening that, you know, it's not time to freak out over that. But sometimes sellers will be like, why didn't my house sell this weekend with multiple offers? And then they're going to fire you. And so that's the thing is that it doesn't take that much of a swing the other direction for this generation of agents to feel a cooling and to feel the stress of having to up their skill level. And if they've only been in this business during this era where, again, I know most of you, this is true buying leads, building teams, building your brand, sure. social networking, TikToking. They've never actually learned 
the skills that are necessary. Right. Guys, the, so there's, again, we're not predicting a, 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 a sizable slowdown. We're, incre- we're predicting a massive increase in opportunity for skills-based agents, especially those of you guys who want to become listing agents. You guys getting what we're saying? There's going to be more demand for uh, sellers or listing agents that have skills. There's going to be the buyer's agent side of the business appears to me to be very much on its heels. Uh, and look, there's a big, uh, I don't know if you've been following it on mm-hmm. Inman, there's a big back and forth about whether or not NAR should pass rules that are going to make it so that on the listings in, as they appear on IDEX is not just national sites, yep. where the a listing agent and the listing broker are yes. going to be prominently featured at the top of the, the yes, pages. I saw that. Whereas the agents who are sponsoring, I, i.e. all the agents that are buying the, trying to I mean, let's just be trying honest. Trying to suck business off of the listing agent. Trying to suck business off the listing agent, but also is very deceptive. There's, you cannot argue sure in a million years that it's not intentionally designed to be deceptive to the consumer. Absolutely. You, if Julie and I, look, guys, if you're go, go to realtor.com and try and work and see how much work it is to trying to find out who the listing agent is. Well, they know the ones, it's so funny, the ones that do pay for that to be featured on somebody else's listing, right? They always ask the question, when I get a buyer that calls and says, are you the listing agent? How do I handle that? And they said, that's the first thing every buyer is going to ask. Don't you guys get it? The sellers, and some of you guys, especially those, and we're not disagreeing with you. We actually agree with you. But the buyer's agents are saying, well, then that buyer's not going to be represented. That buyer doesn't really give a rat's ass. They just want to buy the house. Right. Okay. The whole yep. buyer's agency thing, it is definitely a valid business model. There's definitely a uh, space for it in the marketplace. But in a hot seller's market, the first thing that's going to go, and it already has, and it already is going to continue, is buyer agent commissions. And it's just going to get worse next year. And uh, look, guys, these are all, we're going to talk about more about yeah. this on our prediction show. Hopefully you've enjoyed our stories. But Julie, let's do knock out these last <laughs> couple points. What, Back well, to topic. What, what was the topic? I don't that, remember. That was a big detour. But it was fun. Um, we're talking about, uh, you know, talking to your past clients, centers of influence, and how to both Talk to them, but also expand your list of people who know you. I think we're on four. Point uh, yes. method four. Point number method number four. So this is actually the continuation of yesterday and the day before. Yes. Okay. So method number four of expansion. After virtually every conversation, quote in real life, as all of you guys are fond of saying, IRL in real life, meaning not on social media, end the conversation with, "Who do you know who I should be helping with their real estate needs?" We talked yesterday about the difference between asking, do you know anyone versus who do you know who I should be helping buy or sell real estate? Rob Johnson in Greenwich, Connecticut. He's the number yes. one agent in, in, uh, with his brand up in Greenwich. His, I think he's going to close $160 million. We started coaching him right when he got us, basically when he went from being an investor to wanting to sell real estate full time. Mm-hmm. Absolute sweetheart, first class gentleman, incredible. Greenwich, Connecticut, again, this is one of the most... Greenwich, if you don't know it, is one of the most expensive and most competitive real estate markets on planet Earth. It's blue blood money in the bluest of sense. And okay? very expensive. And incredibly expensive. And just as difficult as you possibly can imagine to get a any kind of business in there, let alone what he did, which has become the dominant listing agent. So when I started, Julie and I started coaching him, and this was years ago, the first thing he said to us is, no way in hell am I ever going to uh, pick up the phone. I'm never going to go after any kind of expired or for sale by owners. And at the at, no, there weren't very many FISBOs, but in his market, it basically it wasn't a, you know, the old the old joke in, um, in, a, in a buyer's market is, uh, Julie and I will role play mm. for you guys. Hey, Julie, you want to know the secret to being a successful listing agent? What? Have the listing when, when it, it sells. sells, right? Yeah. So that means it, that basically uh, most of the listings are going to go through three, four, five listing agents. And his market was in a market like that. For a so long we, time. So we had to get him going after the expireds. He would not mm-hmm. be proactive. Okay, we have to take a different approach. And we you know, finally figured out he's really good at centers of influence and past clients, as most of you are, because it's, frankly, you're just doing, you're just being you, doing what you like to do, hanging out with your friends and centers of influence. It's natural. Right. Then the next pro- step was, ending every single conversation that he had with a simple question, oh, by the way, whom, and he was British, so whom do you know who's thinking about buying or selling that I should be helping in this market? So that's the question that he would, and I would hold him accountable to asking that question um, every single day, a certain amount of times, and he had to report to me at the end of the day. And he had to report to me saying who he asked the question of. So it couldn't just be of some stranger, it had to be somebody he had had an intentional conversation with and it could have just been talking about anything. 
the school run, the sports, the this is and the other things. It doesn't really matter. And ends every conversation with, oh, mm-hmm. God, I can't do my British accent. No. But, he, but said, he does it. He said, you know, regally. And he did said, he kind of um, tell them, did he start out being a little bit weird about that or did he take right oh, to Oh, no, it? he definitely was weird about it. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, I mean, he definitely was. The first thing was he started doing organized centers of influence and past clients thing. Okay, mm-hmm. we're going to schedule it out a few months in a row. You're going to be doing this on this. You know, this is Greenwich, Connecticut. So there was the shooting club and it's the cigar, like cigar smoking club. club. Yeah. Exactly. And all these little, you know, sort of ridiculousnesses that only happen amongst aristocrats, of which he wasn't, but he basically made himself one. Mm -hmm. And so he, you know, he was British. And when we first started uh, coaching him, when we first started coaching him, he would, he was, his vehicle was a, um, a old pickup truck, right? Because he was just doing high end rehabs. And now Rob was very successful investor. He had done really well on Wall Street, had a very nice education, but he just wasn't somebody that was appearing as if. Uh, like he looked like a, a contractor, basically. Yeah. You know, some guy, Regular guy. Some guy who's here to fix your roof. Now, I mean, you guys get what I'm saying. So the first thing we had him do is we got pictures of him. We made him go out and make make him look like a British gentleman, not to the point that he where actually he, sounds like. Right, which he actually sounds like. Yeah. And then we had him buy a Range Rover. Right. <laughs> okay. And then we started having him play up the Britishness of, uh, that he is. And that then would start making people uh, he started associating with, you know, the certain qualities and, and of, of being a, an Anglophile. Right. All Americans, especially uh, in Greenwich, Connecticut, they have crushes on the British culture. They're yes. called Anglophiles. And so here he was playing into that. Perfect. And that was one of the things. And so that was stage one. Stage two, like I said, was scheduling these social events. And stage three was is starting to keep track in an organized fashion the conversations he was having and ending every conversation with, oh, by the way, who do you know who's thinking about buying or selling real estate that I should be helping? Eventually, we got rid of the buying. Who do you know who uh, is ha- that, you know, you just remove the buyer and say seller. And then that is what started getting him listing leads. And he started to network amongst those same people on a regular basis. Guys, this is coaching. And how long do you would because they're going to ask how long do you think it took for him to become not just comfortable with it, but also start to get results? Well, when we started coaching him, Julie, and I still have his notes from the first call, maybe second call, his stated goal was to be the number one agent in Greenwich. Mm -hmm. It probably took him three or four years. That's Honestly. still a pretty short trajectory oh, for a place like Greenwich. Well, it, yeah. what's especially <laughs> incredible about a place like Greenwich, similar but not the same, nowhere near the same as where we sold in New Albany, Ohio, mm-hmm. is that it's very inbred. And I mean that in a, I mean that yeah. in a cultural, educational, and frankly, financial way. Uh, the family sometimes would – they have relationships that would go back generations in Greenwich. Yeah. So he would have the, ki- the the you know, oh, I know them from the boarding school. I know this one. They went to, you know, this place for the summers yeah. in Paris and A crap like that. very center of influence type right. of and, place. And it, and it would be the par- – it would be everyone going back generations. And then sometimes you would see literal, like, you know, what would be like 100 years ago, this family married into this family. Mm-hmm. So if you want to talk about a market that's hard to get into, it's that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's, a, it's basically, if you guys are familiar with a caste system like they have in India, when you're dealing with the really upper end and old, um, it, in parts of the world, like I would say Greenwich, probably the aristocratic side is very familiar or very similar to say what you'd experience in Italy or what you'd experience yeah, in Portugal or sure. what you'd experience in, you know, certainly, um, you know, the UK, mm-hmm. where there's going to be, okay, there's essentially the parvenu, and just not to use Marxist terms on you guys, but there's essentially new money and old money. Well, old money will hang out with new money but just for enough to be friendly and and in old money worlds like where he sells yeah. y- if you're not born into that family or into that uh, sort of type of thing you have to work your ass off to earn your way into but it but it and, can be done and he did both right mm-hmm. so he was able to work i mean he had cut, he had um Tommy Hilfiger he had some of the the stories he would tell me the real estate <laughs> stories i hear from Rob were just extraordinary definitely you know the <laughs> I could tell more stories, but I'm not going to. <laughs> story I got to keep. I got to keep some of them. You know, some of the powder dry. But he would. Yeah. He, we would. T- he would tell me that. Oh, I am working with someone. He wouldn't say names, right? He would say, "I'm showing this property. We just listed this one for this, the other thing." And I'm from Ohio. I'm just a poor kid from Ohio. So damn right, I want to know who's buying a Give fifty me the million dollar house, right? And then he would tell me the names and the interconnections, and it was just so fascinating. It was. You know, like he was working with um, the the Bush family, as mm-hmm. in President Bush. Mm-hmm. They had fam- they had uh, I think second generation or second cousins that were very dominant. I forget what industry he would work with some of them. A lot of celebrity types. Poor people. Basically. Yeah, poor people. Yeah. Right, poor people you've never heard of. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, no, so. but he has a fascinating story, and I always enjoy hearing bits and pieces from that because he's a great example of somebody who 
was coachable, did what you asked him to do, polished up his act, got, uh, got the skill going, decided to say the script even though he was not that comfortable in the beginning. Well, I had to hold him accountable. And, yes. and so you'd ask, well, why after all those years would he still like, you know, pay for coaching, right? Yeah. Why was he still a coaching client? It's because Julie and I were the only ones that were holding him accountable to asking those questions. Mm-hmm. You know, our goal is not to have a lifelong relationship with coaching clients. I know that sounds <laughs> counterintuitive, but it's true. Our goal is to get you guys to your, to your stated goals. Yeah, give you and that, wings. And, that, and give you wings. And at that point, most of you, when you have consistent business, you only need to bring us in occasionally to help you get things back on track if they fall off track. But for the most part, that's where our goal is to not – I know, again, it sounds crazy for me to say this, but it's true. Mm-hmm. Our goal is to get you guys to the point where you're generating business consistently and you've actually got a profit-driven uh, business where you're making, like Rob does, you're making 60 to 70% margins. That's what we are focused on. We're not, our, you know, we're not trying to create this sort of you know, guru-type relationship with any of you. We want you to be independent of us. Our, our ultimate goal, and we've had it happen you know, many times – is we want you to call us up one day and we want you to fire us because you're able to produce so much passive income from the different spokes that came as a result of the net profit you made from selling real estate. And you've learned to hold yourself accountable. Right. And we, you know, it's, it, we've had that, I had that happen probably twice this year. Mm-hmm. And it was great. Absolutely. Yeah. Tim, That's I, what's supposed to happen. I've got enough money coming in passively. I'm going to sell my practice and this is what we're going to do. You know, we started out, you know, five, seven years ago, and this was what we accomplished. We accomplished these goals. I've got income that's going to self-replicate. I've got income that's now producing income by itself. You know, that would be, you could argue, inflation or appreciation. It would be assets that appreciate that. that so if someone needs, for example, you know, $250,000 a year to have a great life, and they've accumulated enough assets that produce in excess of two hundred fifty, not only does the ass, do the assets produce two hundred fifty, but they also produce like an additional, um, you know, appreciation or additional cash flow of another 250 and that money then becomes investable you guys see how this works but that only happens to those of you who decide to think bigger who decide to master the art and science of being the best version of yourself as a real estate practitioner exactly so on that note we'll round out with method number five and give them some suggestions take the three by four challenge what is that it's three meetups per week for four weeks straight what are meetups these are meetings things that you know, clubs and events that you guys always need to do more of this than you think. And use meetup.com to find what interests you already have or re-engage in the things you used to do do or know that you enjoy. There's a lot of other things other than meetup.com. There's so many different things you guys can be using. Well, sure. That's just a place to get started. Um, So there are three categories to jump into here. Uh, Category A, things you like to do anyway. I put that first because I know they're more likely to actually do it repetitively. For sure. That could be hobbies, sports, arts, orange theory, um, you know, all of that kind of thing that you like anyway. Then category B, business networking for the sake of networking. That could be BNI, Chamber of Commerce, Toastmaster, Young Entrepreneurs Club, Women in Business, stuff like that. And then C, charitable events, auctions, food drives, toy drives, fundraisers. So basically, get yourself out there. You you know, it's so funny. The agents, if you ask them, you can choose your next listing. What would you like it to be? And they'll always say, repeat, referral, past clients, somebody that I already knows, loves, and trusts me that I probably am not going to have to compete with. And yet, do they do enough of this to get that as frequently? Don't read that. Uh, Okay, so guys, there it is. And we're going to give you a homework assignment. If you've not yet completed your 2022 business plan yet, please do text 2022 to 47372. Text 2022 to 47372. When you do, we're, you have to, we're going to text you back. Then you have to say, yes, I want the treasure map. You're going to uh, text back yes. And then we're going to text you back a link. And that link's going to download your 2022 real estate uh, business plan. That's a fill-in-the-blank real estate treasure map, fill-in-the-blank business plan. It's 63 pages. I'm warning you because you might need to buy a ream of paper. The first probably 75% of it is an explanation on how to Choose goals, set goals, uh, and it's done in Julie and I's typical no BS fashion. It's not a lot of puffery or fluffery in this thing. It's just designed to get you into action, help you make your business and life goals. Drills down. Remember, goal is a dream with an action plan. Most of you write down goals, no action plan, and then you add a sprinkling of accountability and you're actually going to accomplish something. Get that done now. Text 2022 to 47372. And by the way, when you're there, feel free to schedule a free coaching call with one of our new member coaches. We do have... Uh, frankly, this time of year is a very great time to get a free coaching call, a business planning call with one of our new member coaches. 
because it's almost Thanksgiving and they're not that busy. So go ahead and text 2022 to 47372. Text 2022 to 47372. And you'll be getting the treasure map. And you'll also be entitled to a free coaching call with one of our new member coaches. In the meantime, you guys, have a fantastic weekend. If you need us for anything, if you have any show ideas or suggestions, we're always interested in what you have to say. Text me directly at 512-758-0206. Don't call. Text 512-758-0206. And of course, if you're ready to join eXp and you're looking for a sponsor that's going to be very proactive in your success at eXp, Julie and I are formally applying for the job of being your eXp sponsor. Please text me directly and Julie and myself will get back with you directly at 512-758-0206. So if you're ready to join eXp and you're looking for a sponsor and most of you are either on the way to joining eXp or ready to join now looking for a sponsor and you have not chosen one, please do consider Julie and I, 512-758-0206. In the meantime, a fantastic weekend. We'll talk with you on Monday. Oh, and as always, please do give us a five-star review on iTunes. We sincerely appreciate it, guys. It does us a hell of a lot of good with helping us get the word out about this industry and all the good that can come from it. And, you know, frankly, you guys are helping Julie and I be in alignment with our highest and truest uh, purpose on this planet, which is being of service to all of you. Help us do that by giving us a five-star review on iTunes. And then iTunes then says, well, you know, Bob liked the podcast. Maybe, you know, Claudette in, in Alaska will like it. And then it starts exposing our show to more potential listeners. So please do give us a five-star review on iTunes. Have a fantastic day. We'll talk with you on the show tomorrow. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com. <laughs> <laughs>